name. Amen. Okay, um, on Sunday we started a, a new unit, Lesson 16. I just kind of want to briefly go over some of the highlights of it. Um, it begins in Chapter 4, Mark. We see that the scene now shifts north to Galilee. Um, the Synoptic Gospels focus on this great Galilean ministry, which lasted about a year and a half. It's interesting that Jesus and his disciples had been enjoying much success in Judea and teaching and baptizing even more than John the Baptist had been. And all of a sudden they want to pull up stakes and go and go north. And there's a couple of reasons why. Um, well, of course, everything that Jesus did was the divine call of God and the divine will of God. But um, possibility, since John the Baptist, Jesus had gotten word that he had been thrown into prison, uh, maybe he was concerned about trying to get his disciples together and not scattering. Although later on we're going to see that he spent two days with the Samaritan woman and the folks from there. And so that might not be the case. Um, and, of course, we know that uh, John the Baptist was thrown into prison because he told Herod, the Tetrarch, that he was in sin living with his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. He told her, it's not un uh, lawful for you to have her, Matthew 14, 4. And, of course, this infuriated her, and she pushed to get him arrested. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, Jesus may have wanted to avoid direct conflict with the Pharisees at this time. I mean, uh, it wasn't time yet. And timing's everything we know. Um, Jesus wanted to avoid direct confrontation with the Pharisees, at least for a while. So he left the province where their influence was the greatest. And the third reason we talked about, it, again, is a divine calling. Jesus goes where God tells him to go. It was interesting in um, verse 2, well, 1 and 2, let's, let's just go over it again. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more of the disciples than John. And then verse 2 says, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his, but, but his disciples did. And I asked the question, was there a conflict? And the answer is no. Because baptism is neither validated or invalidated by the identity of the one who is performing the baptism. Very, very much true. Um, and, you know, Jesus probably perhaps he refrained from baptizing people in order to prevent someone claiming special virtue uh, from having been baptized by Jesus himself. Um, I asked a question about, was there another way that the disciples and Jesus could have gone to uh, Galilee? And that is, yes, there was. They could have gone to the east, across the Jordan River, gone north, and just south of the uh, um, uh, sea, uh, sea of Galilee, to uh, go back west into Galilee itself. Um, but they took the direct route. They took the direct route. Um, they talked about uh, Jesus, or John identifies Sychar, S-Y-C-H-A-R, as being near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And it says in verse 6 that Jesus being wearied, he was tired. What a human nature that thing of being tired is. Everybody gets tired. Uh, Bible says it was about the sixth hour when they stopped. And in Jewish time, that would have been about 12 noon. In Roman time, about 6 p.m. Either one of those would have been fine because it would have been a normal stop for somebody traveling. And then we see in verse 7 that he has a conversation with the Samaritan woman. And we talked in detail about what the relationship was between the Samaritans and the Jews. Pure hatred. Uh, Jews thought the Samaritans were half-breeds, mongrels. And it goes way back in, uh, in time. This, uh, this feud, if you will. Um, but, the, uh, the, but Jesus then asked the woman for a drink. And um, that's, I think, about where we need to pick up at. Let me... Uh... Okay, let's look again at verse 10. This was right after uh, in 9 that... Uh, uh, the woman of the Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask 
a drink for me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We talked about the possibility of how the Samaritan woman could have identified Jesus as a Jew, you know, uh, maybe by his accent, maybe by the clothes he was wearing, the weave pattern maybe, uh, signifying that he was from Galilee. It, it doesn't say we can only speculate. Um, and so then uh, in verse 10, Jesus, and, and this is what we're pick up, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. We talked about, I think, did the Samaritan woman really understand what Jesus meant? No. She's still thinking of the good old H2O. Good old water. If we go back to verse 9 where it says, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, this means more specifically that the Jews do not use utensils in common with the Samaritans. This would have been a problem for the Jews. A ceremonial defilement uh, would have resulted if, in Jesus drinking water from the Samaritans' utensils. Now look at the response, uh, or, or look at, uh, let's go to uh, verse 13 and 14. Again, the Samaritan woman is still thinking H2O water. And Jesus' response in 13 says, Jesus answered and said, said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, referring to the water from the well, is what, what he's saying. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Again, in this uh, statement, Jesus defined the living water. He promised as a spiritual power leading to eternal life. In verse 15, as you look at her, uh, the, uh, look at the response. The woman said to him, Sir, give me, sir, being a sign of respect, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Again, she doesn't understand. She still thinks H2O. Some element of misunderstanding is evident. Apparently, she realized that Jesus was speaking of some kind of special water. She acknowledged that, but not exactly sure what kind it was. But she knew she desired the water so that she would neither thirst nor have to continue coming to the well to draw water. Uh, that's that's what she thought that this kind of water that Jesus was going to give her uh, would do for her. She wouldn't have to drink regular water anymore. The woman's confusion could probably never be carried or cleared up as long as the conversation was about thirst and water. Okay, so Jesus had to switch gears. Therefore, what seems to be an abrupt change was introduced by Jesus in order to focus on her moral and spiritual needs. Jesus confronted her with her spiritual condition by saying, and let's look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. Jesus demonstrated an incredible ability to meet a person wherever he or she was and guide that individual to focus on spiritual needs. This woman responded to Jesus' command with a kind of a terse, sharp remark. She said, I have no husband. I have no husband. And that's in uh, verse 17. You see, she wished to stop the discussion from involving her moral life. And, and this is not surprising. Think about it. Many people would rather discuss abstract matters than to focus on their own moral or spiritual responsibilities. We've probably all met people like that, haven't we? Sometimes, I think. Um, but Jesus did not let her change the subject. Instead, he confirmed what she said was true. In fact, he goes on to say that she had had five husbands. Do we know what happened to these gentlemen? No, we don't. And, and one thing to keep in mind, the word husband can mean man. Okay? So what Jesus was 
really saying was she was living in fornication with five men. Okay? We don't know what happened to them. We don't know if some were husbands, if she got divorces, or they divorced her. But the point here is that by revealing Jesus' supernatural knowledge of the woman's moral condition, Jesus was preparing her heart to receive the wonderful gift he offered. Thoughts or comments? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right? All sorts. By all means, it's a difficult situation, and I'm, I, I can't speak for the congregation. Jason, comment? Yeah, no, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I don't know. And going back to your thought, you know, that's a decision. I mean, the elders would have to make, uh, given a lot of, you know, that's a lot of things have to come into play. Um, you know, there may be restraining orders keeping that person away from kids for a certain amount of feet. I don't know. Uh, you know, hopefully, if that person is truly sorry and repentant, uh, you know, then there would be a means of you know, trying to help that person get get a bit better, a bit more. Jack? Yeah. Absolutely. There will certainly be some stringent guidelines. Correct. That's right. Yeah, he's exactly right. Anybody else? Uh, uh, Dave?
there has to be a lot more information divulged, you know, than that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a difficult, difficult situation. So. We all are. And, and I'm sure in that woman's mind that she was surprised, you know, that he didn't point out. I mean, he, he, he called it what it is. But like Jason said, Jesus is providing for her those spiritual needs that she so deeply needed. That was his main point. Um, and, and, and we see, based on those supernatural insights of Jesus, the woman said in verse 19, Sir... Again, a sign of respect. I perceive that you are a prophet, in effect, admitting her guilt. She didn't try to, you know, say, oh, no, that, that's not me. She knew. Um, she did not refer to him as the prophet, as if she had in mind what Moses' statement uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 18, 15 uh, through 19, but simply as a prophet. See, the Samaritans were awaiting a prophet like Moses. Find that in Deuteronomy 18 and 18. Because Jesus had demonstrated his divine knowledge of her circumstances, she understood him to be someone with special insight. Okay? She didn't know exactly what, but she knew something was different. She wants more information. Look at verse 20. It says, Our fathers worship on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. This mountain that she is referring to is Mount Gerizim. I may not be saying that exactly right, but I think so. It was where the Samaritans had built their temple. She wants to know the right place to worship. Both groups, Samaritans and Jews, agreed that God has commanded their ancestors to worship in a place God will choose. And we see that in Deuteronomy 12 and 5. But where? Where? Look at Jesus' response in verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. See, Jesus' response to this lady was something she wasn't expecting. Jesus did not cite any explicit teachings to support Jerusalem as the proper place of worship, nor did he allow himself to be drawn into this age-long dispute. His reply may be captured in three parts. First, worship is not determined by a physical location. Could we worship someplace other than this building? Sure we could. Somebody's home, in the parking lot. This is just a building. It keeps us out of the elements and it's nice and comfortable. Nice and comfortable. Jesus said an hour is coming. And what that means is it's in, in a definite period of time. Don't know when, but when worship would not be tied to a place like Jerusalem or Jerusalem. Second, Jewish worship was more informed than Samaritan worship, worship. Look at verse 22. Jesus says, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. See, although the Samaritans worship the right God, their rejection of the prophets, the historical books, and the Psalms limited their knowledge of God's nature and His will. Samaritans had their own Pentateuch. Am I saying that right? Pentateuch? It, they rewrote it the way they wanted to. 
It was different than the Jewish one. And the third reason is that true worship is in spirit and in truth. Look at verse 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. See, Jesus is saying a new system of worship would be inaugurated, worship that is approved by God. It's not tied to a physical location. It's not where, but more importantly, who and how to worship that is important. What was the old system of worship like? Give me some examples. Animal sacrifices, right? Uh, special clothing for the priest. Burning of incense, instrumental music, um, other items and practices that appealed to the physical side of man. Yeah, places. Absolutely. Put more emphasis on that. Jesus announced that worship was henceforth going to be in spirit and truth. God's way to worship. So what is God's way to worship? Spirit and truth. Wait, wait, okay. Um, think about the way we worship. What do we do? That's right. But what do we do? We sing. We pray. We teach. We partake of the communion. We give of our means. That's right. Now, what I just mentioned, those are the acts of service. Okay? And, and this is important. I can come to church on Sunday or any time, sit in the back of a row there, get up, and this thing can be going on. I'm going to look at my watch. Go, oh, man, the football game starts in two hours. Okay? Uh, my mind could be a hundred different places. You know, Matt gets up to preach. I'm going, hurry up, Matt. Just hurry up. Am I worshiping God in spirit and truth? No. No. Go ahead. No, please. And, 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 of course, we, I hope we all, worship God more than just Sunday or Wednesday night. I mean, all the time. Jack? Yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think this will help maybe clarify a little bit. True worship involves a connection between the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the worshiper. Okay, when you think about it. It involves thinking, attitude, emotion of the worshiper. It's that personal relationship with God. Does that make sense? It's all the time. It's all the time. Yes, sir.
I think one of the most beautiful places to worship is when you go up to Yosemite Bible Camp or Tahoe Family Encampment, you know, or when I'm in Colorado hunting with Jason and everybody else at 9,500 feet and I'm in a, looking up a valley that's just as gorgeous as could be. Oh, for them to build something like that, sure. It could have been used so much better, I think. They didn't ask me, though. That's the problem. Anyway, good comments. Other comments? Today, too, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Honest? That's exactly right. Good point. No, he, we can't get it. Jason? And where do we spend the majority of our time? I mean, what we spend, what, four hours a week in church? At, at the church building? Church? What, a publican? <laughs> I think so. I, th I think it's a person is a tax collector. Okay, good. Any other thoughts? All right, moving on. Look at verse 25. As the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, then he will tell us things. She anticipated that the coming of the Messiah would declare all things to his people. To this woman, Jesus disclosed his true identity. He himself was the long way to the Messiah. Turn, or in my Bible, turn to the next page and look at verse 26. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, this may be the only time he shared this great truth with anyone apart from his disciples prior to his trial when he was put on trial. So this woman had great, great insight. And, and, and when we think about it, see if I can remember the order. She first said, you're a Jew. Then called him, uh, uh, are, are, are you greater than Jacob? Then a prophet. And then she goes, maybe the Messiah. And then we're going to see later on when she goes back down to the city where she's from, we'll see what she, response she has there. I don't want to spoil it. Any other comments before we go on? Yes, Mark. Well, and I'm sure the wheels were spinning so fast, smoke was coming out. Because look of all the things she, you know, he knew all about her life. You know, everything. Very, very interesting. Oh, big time. Hmm. Yeah. And it could be more, but this is only what John has recorded. Now, in verses 27 through 42, we're going to see that Jesus' teachings had a far-reaching effect. Um, let's read verse 27, please. And at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he had talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you see? Or, why are you talking with her? Now, i got two questions for you. Question number one. Why do you think that when the disciples got back from buying the food, 
that they didn't ask the Samaritan woman themselves, what do you see? Think about that for a minute. And then my second question is, why didn't they ask Jesus? Why are you talking with her? Okay, answer number one. Why do you think that when the uh, disciples got back, they didn't ask the Samaritan woman, what do you see? Exactly right. If they had asked her anything, they would have been guilty of that which that astonished them to begin with. So, yes, correct answer. Great. Answer number two. Why didn't they ask Jesus? Why are you talking with her? Or why are you? A little bit more involved, maybe. Uh, perhaps they refrained from asking Jesus anything because of the awkward situation such a question would have created. Makes sense. Or uh, they may not have asked uh, Jesus out of respect for him. That's certainly a possibility. Supposing, and of course he did, that he had good reasons for his behavior. That's another reason. But the encounter with Jesus, uh, but the encounter with Jesus had such a profound impact on the woman that she left her water pot. Look at verse 28. The woman then left her water pot, water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men. She went all the way back down the city to tell the townspeople, hey, you got to listen to this. Think about the progression that has taken place. We talked about this just literally. Calls him a Jew, greater than Jacob, calls him a prophet, knows the Messiah is coming, and Jesus confirmed it to her. She goes into the town and says, come. See a man who has told me all the things I have done. Now, think about it. This would have piqued their interest. She made the statement, this is not the Christ, is it? You know, she, the way she worded that made all the difference, I think, in the world. Had she come down there and say, I have found the Christ, they probably would have thought, eh, a little loony too, you know. And not put very much water and credence into it. But the way she worded it piqued their interest uh, to the point that they had to go see themselves. This woman, think about it, influenced an entire city to come see Jesus. Now, we don't know for sure how many there was, but it could have been a large number. Look, skip a few verses down to 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Don't know how many and many is, but quite a few it could be. Thoughts, comments, questions? Oh, absolutely. Jeanette? Yeah. Comfort zone. Good point. Good point. Yes, Jason. Oh, I'm sorry, Galen. Right? Oh, that, yeah, and, and that's entirely a possibility, you know. comment? Yeah, Jack? Important. Yeah, she left the water pot. Yeah. Hurry, hurried on down. Yeah, absolutely. 
And we're going to see in verses uh, 31 through 38, that those disciples misunderstood what was really needed here. Uh, you know, the disciples had come back from town with food. Okay, They had gone to buy. They urged Jesus to eat. Look at verse 31. It says, in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Rabbi, eat. Um, and, but notice what Jesus said to them in verse 32. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Um, it's really interesting to note, though tired and thirsty from his journey, we see that back, you know, verses 6 and 7, and no doubt hungry, no doubt hungry, Jesus' response to the disciples was that he had food to eat, which they had no knowledge. They had no knowledge. The disciples' response in verse 33 really shows they were thinking about physical food. And in a way, it's comical, because look at what it says. Uh, verse 33. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? It's like, okay, which one of you did it? Come on, fess up. And it, it, it is a little bit comical, but they didn't know. They didn't know. And so, um, we see in verse 34, Jesus explains the kind of food he was referring to. Let's read it together. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus, more than anyone else ever, has demonstrated the truth of Deuteronomy 8 and 3. That man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. You see, in ministering to the Samaritan woman and to others, Jesus found greater sustenance than any food that the disciples might have provided that which they brought, bought, brought back up. His focus was what? On the mission that he was sent to do. It was so intense that his physical needs and desires were secondary. It reminds me of when he was going through the temptation, you know, and he fasted all those days. His hunger was secondary. He was focused. Focus. That's why Jesus could say at the end of his ministry, in the shadow of the cross, when he was praying to the Father, I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work you have given me to do. We're going to read about that later on in chapter 17 of John and verse 4. Thoughts or comments? <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't think about the pizza. Mark. That's exactly right. Absolutely. He's got his priorities straight. Yeah. Other comments? I'm still going to go a few more minutes, I think. Um, Verses 35 through 38 have a number of things to ponder. Uh, let's read, uh, if someone read, would like to, verse 35 for me, please. Just 35 itself. Yeah, this is kind of a difficult passage to understand. The statement of the four months is open to really two interpretations. First one, this incident could have taken place in December or January, and four months before the harvest, which would normally be in May or June. Okay, that makes sense. According to this interpretation, Jesus would be saying, you say that four more months must pass before harvest time, but there is a harvest ready for reaping speaking of the people of the city who were coming out to see him. That makes sense, right? The second interpretation, since Jesus said, do you not say, in verse 35, the first part of it, he may have been quoting a prover proverbial expression, four more months than the harvest. In this case, Jesus was alluding to the coming of the Samaritans when he continued, but I say the seed has just been sown and the harvest here." Uh, is already. Whatever the exact meaning of the four months may be, Jesus was stressing the importance 
and urgency of his work. Okay? Needed to be done. Uh, in verse 36, uh, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Uh, the New American Standard ESV says already um, uh, he who reaps. Already he who reaps. In um, the King James there it says uh, uh, in the first part, um, for they are already white for harvest. Um, you can attach that already to either the first part of uh, 36 or the last part of 35. Uh, and either is possible in the Greek language to do that. If you join it to verse 35, the idea is that the fields were ready for harvest with no interval between sowing and harvesting. Okay. Um, if, let's see, I lost my place, I'm sorry. like the response of the Samaritans, okay? If you join it to verse 36, then the reaper is said to be already at work in the harvest, already receiving his wages, and already gathering fruit for eternal life. In this case, there is no interval between harvesting and receiving wages. Either way, either way, this is so, uh, in order that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Okay? Uh, we'll see that uh, what Jesus says in verse 37 is a metaphor of the harvest used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6, where he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but who gives the increase? God. God gives the increase. Okay, I think this might be a good place to stop. Are there any final comments? Uh, closing? Yes, Ed. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and they're still learning. They're, the disciples are in their infancy, if you will. And they have so much to take in and comprehend. Uh, it's amazing. Mark. Oh, okay. Yeah. They got it figured out before. I know some of it makes no sense. Hey, thank you everybody for a great class. We will finish up. Uh, it won't take us very much longer. Uh, of the of the uh, lesson sixteen on Sunday. We'll answer the questions, and then we'll start on Lesson 17, okay? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, 17 I mean, is a little bit disjointed. You have uh, the remainder of Chapter 4, then you jump. So, anyway.